Thank you all for, uh, for coming here this Sunday afternoon. Um, my name is Matthew. For those who have not met me, um, I'm accompanied today by a couple of brilliant speakers. Uh, one, Nicholas, who is a, a dancer with the Grand Ballet of Montreal, and Christine, who is a pianist and a teacher, a lecturer. And uh, together, we're going to be giving a series of presentations that will hopefully complement uh, one another and introduce what the meaning is of a big change which has recently begun unfolding just a few years ago. And over the last few weeks, we've seen some dramatic changes. So we want to get a deeper appreciation for what these changes are, both as uh, a process in world history and something which reflects a potential for a very beautiful uh, change. Uh, what we hope will be a new renaissance for mankind as a whole, not for any one nation or race, but for the species as a whole. Um, so we want to flush this out a little bit, and I'm going to say a few introductory remarks before Christine uh, speaks. Um, the title of our, uh, of our little event is Cultural Optimism, Beautiful Art in the New Silk Road. Um, the idea is, well, you know, look, we were all born, we're, I think we're all here under our, in, under the age of 40 for the most part, and um, we were all born into a society that had certain limitations. Um, we weren't the cause of those limitations, but there was already a schizophrenic decline that was underway when we were born for the most part. Um, that was largely put into place by the assassinations of a lot of great leaders in the 1960s, both in America and abroad and a change in the economy and the idea of what political economy was uh, around the period of the early 70s when the idea of a consumer society became hegemonic. And all of a sudden there was a process of a complete destruction of the first world country's ability to produce for themselves and an exportation of manufacturing to increasingly poor countries to serve shareholder value in the West. Now, this was not beneficial for, in large part, those countries that received uh, those factory jobs, because all of a sudden these countries had to stay underdeveloped for the, for the most part in order for their labor to remain cheap and for the products that we purchased to be cheap. Um, it didn't benefit the countries who were already developed for the most part because we lost our abilities, whether it's Europe, Canada, the United States, those powers of producing for ourselves that was the foundation for sovereignty was gone, was, was dismantled. Um, if we watch, if we look at the, the news in the mainstream press in the West, it's kind of a scary world that we're given. Um, there's just something that I, I wanted to showcase. Just, you know, if, if you look at a, just the Western media, uh, you see things like, uh, in CBC News, the head of NORAD recently came to Ottawa and he made a, a chilling speech saying, we haven't seen, no wait, how did it begin? We face some more competitive and dangerous international security environment today than we have in generations. We haven't seen the sort of systemic and methodological increase in threats since the height of the Cold War. We must acknowledge the reality that our adversaries currently hold our citizens, our way of life and our national interests at risk. Pretty scary stuff. Um, this is the head of NORAD calling for increased military maneuvers between Canada and the United States and the Arctic to combat Russia and China. And something that Russia and China are doing are supposed to really threaten and scare us. Now, it's, it's also not the case if you were just looking at Western press that you would know what those things are. You know, you get these nebulous claims that Russia has taken hold of the United States and has their, their, their puppet in power under Trump who's trying to get alliances with Russia and China and, and how terrible that is. And China's trying to do these things that uh, involve taking over control of the global empire from the United States by creating debt traps for poor countries to fall into. Very scary stuff. They even want to take, take control of our North Pole and Canada. Very scary. Um, that's actually not at all what's going on. If you actually take a more broad view and you look at what, it, what is this change and... Um, this is what we want to look at is, 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 it, is that the case? Are these claims true or how do we know that they're not true? Um, is, is a society that is founded upon true beauty uh, possible? And beauty is tied, it's historically been tied to an idea of justice. You, you, you know, there's an idea of, of truthfulness as well because obviously if you have a society that disobeys justice, that doesn't mind watching poor people, innocent people suffer and die, 
for a geopolitical doctrine or otherwise, that's very ugly. And people would say, oh, but that's a, that's a ugliness, beauty. Those are as aspects of art. That has nothing to do with politics or economy. That's artistic. And we're of the view, oh, and we agree with the, the founder of the, the Schiller Institute, Helga zeppler who I'm going to quote from a little bit from a recent uh, piece she published in Beijing Review, uh, that that's not the case, that, that any competent approach to uh, political economy is tied to an idea of, of aesthetics, to an idea of justice, and this is what we're seeing is in contrast to those war hawks trying to re reawaken the specter of the Cold War that we just saw for, like the head of, of NORAD. So recently in this v review she said, um, for, <clears throat> for the last several years or so, Western media and mainstream politicians have chosen to largely ignore the Belt and Road Initiative, which Chinese President Xi Jinping proposed in 2013. The initiative, consisting of the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road, efficiently addressed the infrastructure needs of developing countries, which the West simply pretended not to exist. But at a certain point, it dawned on the Western establishment that China was not only building an enormous amount of railways, lines, por uh, railway lines, ports, bridges, power plants, and industrial parks in Asia, Africa, and even in the parts of Europe but that the prospect of poverty alleviation offered by China instilled an unprecedented spirit of optimism. This spirit of optimism and this, that's emerging with the new Silk Road, this Belt and Road Initiative, is something I just want to quickly uh, run through very briefly, maybe in a few minutes, uh, just to set this sort of tone. This, everyone here, I'm, I've, I would imagine, has heard of the Belt and Road Initiative, the new Silk Road, right? Who hasn't? Everyone has, good. So just a quick run through a few milestones. Uh, since it, it emerged as the policy of China, as it was going outside of its, its sort of uh, confines of the borders of China, uh, this was 2013 in Kazakhstan that Xi Jinping announced the new Silk Road, the BRI. Um, this was done at a point of heightened tension when there was a real likelihood of a regime change in Syria. Libya had already been destroyed. There was open awareness of the funding of terrorist activities by the US, Britain, and Saudi Arabia. These were all things that had increasingly started giving the world chills for people who thought that regime change was isolated to Iraq and a few things for oil geopolitics. When people started realizing what the broader implications of a regime change in Syria or Iran was going to be, especially looking at the military encirclement of Russia and China, uh, the idea of nuclear war became a, a real possibility that even people who were uh, very, very uh, indoctrinated geopolitical thinkers, they didn't, that scared them. And, and a little bit of fear sometimes for the right reasons can be a good thing. So coming out of that process, China uh, announced this new uh, philosophy of governance. And it was based upon a different principle than what we've known in the West for a very long time. In 2015, the BRI uh, began a treaty arrangement with Russia's Eurasian Economic Union, uh, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, forgot one. Um, they'll come, doesn't matter. Uh, this is now being consolidated uh, as we speak as a new economic treaty between the BRI and, the, and Russia. Um, last year, September, Africa, the African Union fully joined the BRI. Um, then you have here, I, I, there's a, obviously a lot I'm skipping, but I'm taking some of the key things and then launching into the more recent few weeks, uh, starting with Italy's joining of the Belt and Road Initiative as a memorandum of understanding on March 23rd, which angered a lot of Western geopoliticians um, because now all of a sudden you had a G7 country which was saying that it endorsed and wanted to take advantage of the benefits of the BRI investments, which involved bringing high, I mean this, this we're talking about the, something bigger than, than 20 Marshall Plans, the thing that reconstructed Europe after World War II. Um, so now Italy created a precedent that was followed by Luxembourg and by Switzerland increasingly. Um, just a few weeks after that, Trump created uh, some interesting waves because it, he gave a speech next to the vice premier of China where he basically said that uh, China, the U.S., and Russia need to work together and convert their military funding from war making into something that benefits everybody. 
this separated Trump, it, it sort of demonstrated that there's not one, one United States right now, but you have a battle within the U.S. establishment between different paradigms. Um, Trump himself, who this is at odds with some people within his own cabinet and within the military, within the deep state, but he himself said, but this is in uh, Sputnik News covered this um, on April 5th, where Trump said, between Russia, China, and us, we are all making hundreds of billions of dollars worth of weapons, including nuclear, which is ridiculous. I think it's much better if we all got together and didn't make those weapons. These three countries, I think, can come together and stop the spending and spend on things that are more productive towards long-term peace. Very important concept that, that emerged, because uh, this was not echoed by people like John Bolton or uh, <laughs> a variety of other war hawks around Trump. Now, just after that, a few days later, Greece joined the 16 plus 1 alliance of the Central and Eastern Eurasia, uh, European countries who have alliances with China around the, the Belt and Road Initiative. Some of the biggest infrastructure in the world was, was initiated um, with, and this, this is a meeting that was held in Croatia. Uh, so Greece this now changed the name to 17 plus 1, and Greece plays a key role because it has the port of Piraeus. It has a, a lot of interest in the Belt and Road because part of the Port of Piraeus is that it's an entry point between the Maritime Silk Road, which I'll, I'll just showcase, and the Overland Silk Road that brings in goods from Asia, the Middle East, into Europe and, and back. Next day, you had the Polar Silk Road announced at the Arctic Summit in, summit in Russia, where China and Russia signed a historical uh, scientific agreement, which was recently punctuated just yesterday by Putin, who said that the Polar Silk Road of... Russian development in uh, the Arctic, as well as the shipping lanes in the Arctic, are going to be tied to the Maritime Silk Road of China. Um, you have the Arab uh, br uh, BRI Summit on April 15th and 16th, where $200 billion of dollars worth of infrastructure deals were consolidated and, and uh, finalized between China and the Arab countries. Syria is a big player there because now the Syrian government has seen a chance for themselves to actually have real development that could stabilize the country now that uh, ISIS is largely defeated. Iraq as well is very interested. And now, just yesterday, we had the ending of the second Belt and Road Forum in Beijing that saw um, 37 heads of state, 5,000 participants, 360 ministers, major heads of, of leading organizations. Bless you. Um, very, very big deal. And just to showcase what this is, the official Belt and Road Initiative is essentially illustrated in this beautiful map that includes the Arctic Silk Road, the, Al the Arctic Belt and Road, or the Arctic uh, Maritime Silk Road, um, with the, the, t the more popular one that we've already known up until now in blue, going around Africa through, it, through um, into the Mediterranean, all, all the way around into Eastern Africa, and there we see Athens with the Port of Piraeus being a key node. And as Helga Tseplarouche has made the point for many years, since, I mean, she has been a, a founding thinker behind this with her husband, Lyndon LaRouche, bless you, uh, this is something, I mean, they've been at, on record since the early 1990s calling for this as the basis for a new just economic arrangement of nations. Um, she's made the point that this is no longer confined to this zone, but is increasingly, when we look at what China's been doing, uh, expressing itself on a global level, what the Schiller Institute has called the World Land Bridge. Um, with all sorts of r high speed rail, telecommunications uh, around South America, connections through Central to North America, Arctic, Africa, Middle East, beyond. And this is growing. And you see China already operating uh, in all of these countries. And, I believe it's over 130 countries currently have memorandum of understanding with China on cooperation around the Belt and Road. Uh, the Costa Rica, the ambassador recently said, um, that China is creating a new paradigm for development, which may be as important, perhaps, as Bretton Woods was after World War II. China is calling upon the whole world to design together what the new paradigm is going to be. This is, again, not a unilateral thing, because what she's saying is true. China is not saying they're going to impose this on other countries, but they're asking for a collaboration of countries. Xi Jinping, I'll end with this quote. Uh, recently at the Africa-China Summit of September of last year, made the point that China believes that the sure way to boost China-Africa cooperation is for both sides to leverage its respective strength. It is for China to complement Africa's development through its own growth. 
and it is for both China and Africa to pursue win-win cooperation and common development. In doing so, China follows the principle of giving more and taking less, giving before taking and giving without asking for return. With open arms, we welcome African countries aboard the express train of China's development. No one could hold back the Chinese people or the African people as we march towards rejuvenation. To quote a Chinese saying, the ocean is vast because it rejects no rivers. China is the world's largest developing country, and Af Africa, the, the continent with the largest number of developing countries, have long formed a community with a shared future. Indeed, we share a common stake. China will work with Africa to achieve our shared goal of building a closer China-Africa community with a shared future and turn it into a peace setter for building such a community for mankind. So how do we know that this is actually not just hyperbole, that it's not actually just uh, seductive words by a country that really wants to just do what, the, what Britain or, or the United States have done for the past 60 years and just actually create a debt trap for countries to fall into and, and suck them dry of their resources while leaving them nothing but war and poverty in return? Uh, these are the, the questions that we're going to address in the coming presentations. So I'm going to leave the, the platform to Christine.